I'm sure most of you have heard uh, the story of Helen Keller, right? Uh, she's pretty famous uh, at this point. I remember reading about her in grade school. They taught us about her in school, and um, Helen Keller just has just such a fascinating life story, really one of the most unique stories I've ever, I've ever heard. And when I think about Helen Keller, I think about, you know, if there was ever a person that you could say they were born into adversity, I think it would be her. Um, or if there was ever a person you could say they were born into obscurity, it would be her. If you don't know the story of Helen Keller, at, uh, they say, I think it was at 19 months old, she contracted a disease. I actually didn't know this until, or at least I didn't remember it until I was researching for this. I thought she was born uh, deaf and blind, but uh, actually she contracted a disease at 19 months old. They think it was probably either scarlet fever or meningitis. They're not sure which, but she contracted a disease that left her deaf and blind at 19 months old. And so, as you can imagine, um, being deaf and blind, it's, it's really hard to even, to even imagine what that would really be like. Surely, uh, you would feel pretty much just alone uh, in the world, right? Um, and uh, having contracted the disease at 19 months old, she, of course, you know, a 19-month-old knows some basic words, but they certainly don't know the English language, right? And so she... she uh, basically didn't know how to communicate. She had a few people in her life growing up that she could sort of sign with a little bit, some basic signs. She had, I think, one or two people that she could kind of sign some basic things with. But for the most part, she couldn't communicate with other human beings, couldn't talk to people, basically just alone in her own mind and not even knowing the words to express the things that she would be feeling in her heart. If you can imagine what that would be like. You don't even know the words that are expressing the things that you're feeling and thinking. Uh, it's just a crazy, tr crazy way to exist and, and to go through life. The way that she described it later on uh, is that it was like being at sea in a dense fog all the time. She said it was like being at sea in a dense fog. If you can imagine, just every day of your life, at sea in a dense fog. She... Uh, yeah, she couldn't communicate with the outside world. And so if there ever was, again, a person who maybe felt like they had no future or no purpose in the world, again, I imagine it would probably be her. Nothing really to uh, work towards, nothing to talk about, no relationships really to build on, uh, no goals in mind, nothing to aspire towards, just basically getting by day to day with, with your basic needs. That's pretty much it for her as a child, at sea in a dense fog. She was, of course, if you know her story, as an adult, she was able to overcome a lot of those things. She had a, a teacher who came in and taught her um, how to sign and how to learn more, and she was able to learn how to communicate, and she ended up becoming an author and an activist and, and uh, uh, just a very honored person. She ended up becoming, um, she's on a lot of lists of, you know, most uh, honored or influential uh, people of the 20th century. And so she ended up uh, achieving really great things. Uh, but as a child, you can certainly imagine how she felt uh, probably just completely insignificant and, and overlooked and like her life really was going nowhere fast, right? And we're going to be talking about, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the story of Joseph in our Bible. As if you have your, your Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 37. And I thought about Helen Keller as I was thinking about this first chapter of the book of, uh, of the story of Joseph, because Joseph was also certainly a person who faced a lot of adversity uh, earlier on in his life and um, probably had many, many times in his life where he felt like his life was also going nowhere fast and felt like he was overlooked, insignificant, felt like a nobody and certainly felt that feeling of obscurity. So we're going to start in, in chapter 37 today, and if you don't know the story of Joseph, I'm going to lay a little background for you. So, so in the book of Genesis, um, obviously Genesis is your first book in the Bible, and it, it really lays the groundwork for the story of the rest of your Bible. The, the rest of your Bible after Genesis talks about the Israelites and, and the nation of Israel. 
and their story. And Jesus came out of that nation, of course. Jesus was an Israelite. And so the whole rest of the Bible is about Israel. And in Genesis, we don't really have Israel. We have a guy named Abraham who, who God called to go move to the land that would later become Israel. And God promises to Abraham that he's going to start a family with him and, and great things are going to come through his family. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. And one of these sons is Joseph, who we're going to be focusing on. Okay, so Joseph is kind of one of the forefathers of the nation of Israel. But he's the 11th of Jacob's 12 sons. So if you can imagine, how many of you grew up in a family with at least five kids? Anybody? Yeah? How many, uh, how many six kids? Just a few of you. So it's pretty rare in our culture to even have six kids in a family. If you can imagine having 12 kids running around, uh, and if you can imagine being the 11th of 12, right? So from the very beginning, you feel probably pretty overshadowed and overlooked by your 10 older brothers, all of them brothers. I'm, sh I'm sure they had sisters as well, but that's just 10 older brothers, okay? Um. But chapters 37 through 50 tell us the story of, of, of Joseph, number 11 out of 12, and how God basically worked through his life. Later on in these chapters, we're going to see that God ends up doing great things through Joseph's life, um, that actually he's going to use Joseph to bless uh, the entire land of Egypt and the surrounding regions and, and just do really great things through him. But here in chapter 37, things are, are not so great. For Joseph, okay? Um, I, I don't have time to read the whole chapter, so I'm going to try to summarize here. Joseph is 17 years old at, at the beginning of this chapter. And again, he's the 11th out of 12 sons, but because Joseph was uh, Jacob, his dad had, had multiple wives and, and concubines, and so the 12 sons come from four different ladies, actually. And Joseph, even though he's the 11th of 12, He's the firstborn son of Jacob's wife, Rachel, who just so happened to be his favorite wife, the one that he really loved. And so um, Joseph is the firstborn son from Jacob, from the woman that Jacob really, truly loves. And so um, Jacob tends to favor Joseph a little bit, show favoritism to him over the other brothers. And of course, the other brothers, they don't like that, right? So, so Jacob, for example, gives Joseph this special coat. You've probably heard the coat of many colors. And that's just a sign of the favoritism that he showed towards Joseph. And again, the older brothers, not only did they not like it, it says in the text they actually hated him for it. It uses the word hate. They hated him. And it says they could not even say one good word about him. That's how much they hated him. They just could not even see any redeeming qualities in Joseph. They were so filled with hatred towards him because of the way that their father treated him. Now, it goes about in chapter 37, Joseph ends up having a couple dreams. And in one dream, it says, uh, he told his brothers, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Well, would you look at that? That's such a strange dream. All of these sheaves, you guys, were all bowing down to me. Isn't that a weird dream that I had? And, of course, the brothers, they already hate him, and this doesn't help, right? So they say, do you intend to reign over us, Joseph? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of this dream. And Joseph doesn't stop there. It says, then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers again. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars, again, were bowing down to me. <laughs> and when he told his father this, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Even his father is rebuking him at this point. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And it says his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. We will see by the end of the story that this, this dream sort of uh, is a, a bit of a prophecy for Joseph, that this does end up coming true in a sense, that his brothers do end up relying on him by the end of the story um, and, and pretty much fall into his knees and fall into his feet. But we're not there yet. In chapter 37, all we know is that his brothers are, are very, very angry with him. 
And so he has these dreams, and he makes the mistake of telling his brothers about these dreams. And so his brothers, they hate him even more now. And so what they do is they say, you know what? We've had enough of Joseph, little Joey. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna just going to get rid of this guy. We, we hate him. He, he's no good. Dad loves him more than us. He's having these dreams. We're just going to kill him is what they decide. Let's just throw him in this pit, and then we'll kill him, and, and we'll tell Dad that this some animal devoured him or something like that. The oldest brother, Reuben, he kind of sticks up for Joseph. Reuben says, no, 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 guys, let's not kill him. Um, let's just throw him in this pit, and then we'll decide, we'll decide what to do with him later. And Reuben's planning on leaving him in this pit and then coming back later to save him, is what the text says. So, so Reuben talks the brothers into doing this. Reuben leaves, but before he gets back, before he has a chance to come back and save Joseph, the brothers have already uh, done the evil. They didn't kill him, but they decided, you know what? Here comes some Midianite merchants. Let's just sell him into slavery. If we kill him, we're not going to make a profit off of it. We might as well make a profit off of this, right? So they sell their brother into slavery, which I know that we say that a lot about Joseph, but it's hard to really fathom that idea, isn't it? Selling your own brother into slavery. It is hard to imagine the hate that would have to be in your heart for someone to do that to your own brother. And so they sell their brother into slavery. They take the coat that their father gave Joseph. They, they put some blood on it and they say, look, dad, this, this animal devoured Joseph. And uh, so as far as his dad knows, as far as Jacob knows, Joseph is dead. And so Joseph, pretty much just an ordinary guy, right? Uh, it's not really his fault that his dad favored him. It's not his fault that he was having these dreams. Um, pretty much just an ordinary 17-year-old guy who uh, sort of fell into some unfortunate circumstances, really. And, of course, ended up facing a lot of adversity, sold into slavery, ended up being in slavery or prison, for the next uh, roughly 13 years of his life. So from the age of 17 to the age of 30, he's either a slave or he's a prisoner. And he didn't do anything to deserve it. That's the sad thing about it. He had done absolutely nothing to deserve uh, the cards that were dealt to him. He just faced uh, adversity, uncommon amounts of adversity. And not only are you facing the adversity, but knowing that my own family did this to me. It's a double whammy, right? Not only am I a slave, but even my own family hates me. There is, you can imagine Joseph had times where he felt like there is no one in the world who cares about me. I'm a, I'm a nobody. My life is going nowhere fast. And probably had those thoughts for probably the majority of about 13 years. And in the eyes of the world, he really was pretty much a nobody, right? A slave, in the eyes of the world, is worth nothing, basically. His brothers sold him for 20 shekels of silver, which is about 8 ounces of silver. That's what they got for him. But that's pretty much what he's worth uh, to, to the world. And so Joseph is a nobody, and he certainly feels like a nobody at this point. And maybe he even had thoughts over those next 13 years wondering where God was in this equation, right? Where is God? Why is God not coming to help me? Why, why have these things happened to me? Sort of like the story of Job, right? I have done nothing to deserve these things. Why, why, why have I been dealt these terrible cards? I've done nothing to deserve this. Where is God? Why is God not helping me? Has God abandoned me? Certainly those thoughts had to cross Joseph's mind at some point in these 13 years. But we see, again, by the end of the story, we will see that God did have a plan for Joseph's life. Whether Joseph realized it at the time or not, God did have a plan for his life. Hopefully, none of you have ever been sold into slavery by your siblings, uh, but we've all had low points in life, haven't we? We've all had times where we had these same thoughts and feelings. Why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve these things? Or maybe the thoughts of, is there anybody in the world who cares about me? Would anyone even notice if I wasn't here? These feelings of being a nobody, these feelings like your life is insignificant, like, like your life is, is going nowhere. I think we've all had those moments, haven't we? 
And it can be tempting sometimes to think like this. You know, you think about the fact that, I mean, there's seven, over seven billion people in the world. You know, who's going to notice if I'm gone? The world will continue going on, right? I'm, relatively speaking, I'm pretty insignificant in the eyes of the world. We talked a few weeks ago about how teens today and children today are feeling more lonely and more isolated than ever. And we know that these are things that are, these are thoughts that are becoming more and more common in our culture, even more than they used to be. This idea, this feeling that nobody cares about me. If I take my life, nobody's even going to care. Even, even my parents or my siblings won't even care. And that's why suicide rates are just, are just skyrocketing. They're just going out the roof because more and more kids feeling more and more lonely than ever. They're on the Internet and they see all these amazing things happening, all these crazy things, and they say, well, I'm never going to do any of those things. Or they see all their friends getting all this attention on the Internet, and they say, well, I'm not getting that attention. Right? And this is kind of the, the culture that these kids are being brought up into. And so they sit at home feeling like nobody cares. Granted, not every kid feels like that. I, I'm not trying to paint a, you know, a picture that every child in the world is feeling like that. But it's be, again, it's becoming more and more common, unfortunately. But the story of Joseph is just so great because it reminds us that even when you're going through these difficult times, even when you're feeling like a nobody... When you feel like you're insignificant, we know that the reality is God actually does value you, that you're not a nobody, that in God's eyes you actually are a somebody, and that God actually does have a plan for your life. Even though it may not seem like it right now, God does have a plan for you. The story of Joseph reminds us, first of all, that God has a plan for our lives in spite of our upbringing. In spite of our upbringing, God has a plan for our lives. Some of us feel like our life got off track, like we lost our chance at success before we even had a chance to get started. Some of us are born into just very unfortunate circumstances. Again, like Joseph, the 11th of 12 brothers, favored by his father, hated by his brothers. He was just given a bad lot, right? Um, born into just poor circumstances. And a lot of us go through the same thing. We're born into a family that doesn't treat us well. <laughs> right? We're born into a family where we feel uh, like, you know what, I, I'm a nobody in my family. Nobody cares about me. My teachers don't care about me. My f- people at school don't care about me. I have no chance of success just because of the situation I was born into. Um, maybe our family treats us poorly. Maybe we're picked on at school as a kid. Some people are literally held down by their circumstances. I, I think about kids in the foster care system. I'm starting to learn more about that now, working with Christian Family Services. And I think about kids in the foster care system, kids who are just passed around from house to house their whole childhood, just wondering, you know, is there anyone who really, really cares? Right? They're just passing me around like, this guy doesn't want me. This guy doesn't want me. Can you imagine the type of, of, of life that would, that would be as a child? I've seen kids who are neglected by their parents, kids who um, they, they don't get the education they need because their parents don't give them the time at home. Um, they don't get the nourishment that they need because their parents aren't, aren't feeding them well. They're not getting the social skills they need because their parents don't let them out of the house. And, and again, it's like they never even had a chance to succeed, a lot of, a lot of people. And this is, again, sort of the situation that Joseph is thrown in here. He's a young man with a lot of talents and promise, as we learn later on, but his brothers took any chance of success that he thought he had, and they they literally just ripped it away from him. And that's the way chapter 37 ends. If the story of Joseph ended here, it would be a very sad story. (laughs) Chapter 37 ends with basically no hope. Any chance that, that Joseph had in life was taken away from him here. But again, we see at the end of the story, God tends to uh, change things. God has different plans for Joseph. So we are encouraged by the story of Joseph that, yes, maybe our family or our circumstances held us back, held us down, um, and and made life very difficult for you, um, and maybe made it feel like we never had a shot. But we're encouraged because we know that there are people out there like Joseph and many millions of others in the history of the world who, even though they they were dealt a bad hand, 
um, we see that God did end up working through them and, and, and was with them the whole time. It's very encouraging. The second thing we see from the story of Joseph uh, that reminds us that God has a plan for us is that we see that God had a plan for Joseph also in spite of his failures. And so we know God also has a plan for us in spite of our failures. Joseph is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. I think I've said this before uh, to you guys. I say this when I teach my Pentateuch class at the college. Joseph is one of the most interesting characters in the whole Bible because pretty much every character in the Bible that gets more than a few verses of attention, the biblical authors are always uh, quick to point out their, their sins. Every major character in the Bible we have, just about, we see... Uh, we read not only about the good things they do, but we also read about their sins, right? Abraham uh, was, was a liar. Uh, David was an adulterer and a murderer. Uh, Peter, uh, you know, denied that he even knew who Jesus was. Paul, of course, was a murderer before he became saved. Every great character in the Bible, we see their, their, their good traits, and we also see their very bad traits. And with Joseph, the interesting thing about Joseph is, it, Joseph is he gets about 13 chapters of attention, which is a lot, actually. More than the majority of other characters in the Bible, 13 chapters is a lot. And it never actually tells us a specific sin that Joseph committed. You could say that he made some mistakes, some things that he could have done better, could have made some wiser choices. For example, telling his brother about these dreams was not the wisest choice ever, right? Right? It was pretty naive and, and stupid, if we're being honest. But it's not a sin, right? And the interesting thing about Joseph is it doesn't tell us about any sin that he committed. Now, of course, it's not to say he didn't sin. Of course, he did. But we have to ask ourselves, why does the biblical author choose not to tell us about Joseph's sins? And I think it's to show us that, hey, this person is a person who sets a really good example for us. And we need when we read the story of Joseph, we need to really perk up and pay attention to what's what he's doing because um, the biblical author is telling us this person you need to live by his example and so joseph is just a great character for us to follow but he did make some mistakes again he told his brothers about these dreams he knew his brothers already hated him and he chose to sort of mm, maybe rub it in a little bit right hey check out these dreams i'm having you guys are going to bow down to me one day how do you feel about that Right, And so his uh, circumstances, you could say, uh, were not his fault. But in another way, you could say, well, he kind of put himself in that situation a little bit as well. Right, And that's the case for many of us. Maybe we weren't born into a family that you know, neglected us or abused us. Maybe we weren't bullied in school. Maybe we had a pretty relatively easy childhood. But we made some poor mistakes along the way. We made some poor decisions that led to some hard times. And maybe we feel like our life has gotten off track because of our own failures, our own sins, our own uh, poor decisions. And yeah, I mean, that happens, right? It is oftentimes our, our own poor decisions that lead to the difficult times in life. There's no, there's no denying that. But again, the story of Joseph is proof that God can work in and through our lives in spite of our failures. God worked through Joseph's poor situation to bring about good in the world by the end of the story. We're going to get to that part later on. And so, yes, things might be hard right now. Um, we're not saying life is, is not hard. But the idea that we see from Joseph is that you have no idea what God holds in your future. Right? Right? You have absolutely no idea what God has in store for you. And with God, the great thing is that our past, with Jesus, our past does not have to dictate our future. And I think that's one of the things that we learn from Joseph as well. Our past does not have to dictate our future. We learn, we read all in the New Testament about when Jesus comes in and, and forgives us of our sins, forgives us of our mistakes, um, forgives us of our past, he wipes it clean. It's not like he says, well, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget about that. I'm going to remember those things you did. Actually, it's quite the opposite. What the Bible says about what Jesus does for us and what God does for us is that when he forgives our sins, he wipes them clean. He erases them from his memory. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, 
uh, verse 17, uh, the, the author of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah. It says, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. The Bible makes it clear. When God forgives us, those past mistakes we made are gone. It's like they never happened. And so our past does not have to dictate our future with the Lord. And not only that, but he makes a lot of promises for our future as well, which we're going to talk about. A third thing we learned from the story of Joseph about how God has a plan for us is we see that God has a plan for us in spite of our current obstacles as well. Not just in spite of maybe the upbringing we had, not just in spite of the past decisions that we made, but God has a plan for you Right now, even though you might be currently experiencing the hardest time of your life, you can be encouraged that God does have a plan for you, even though it may not seem like it right now. Some of us in this room today are going through a hard time. Some of us are struggling uh, in our marriage. Some of us are struggling at work. Some of us battle um, things like anxiety and depression. Some of us... Um, uh, Maybe have things going on in our family that are, that are really weighing us down. Maybe you've had trouble keeping a steady job, or maybe your boss hates you, or maybe you don't get along with your coworkers, whatever it is. Stress, right? Things in life bring us down. Um, but whatever it is, again, sometimes it's hard to, in the midst of the hard times, it's hard to see where God is at work in our lives, isn't it? It's just hard to see... Um, how could God possibly be involved in my life? Look at all the bad things that are happening right now. Um, and it's just hard to see how can God have a plan for me with the way things are going right now. But again, we see in the story of Joseph, I mean, if you want to talk about facing obstacles, I mean, I've faced some obstacles, but I've never faced anything like what Joseph faced. And again, we see that, you know what? God was actually there the whole time. And God did have a very specific plan for Joseph. Verse 36, we'll read verse 36 in this chapter. It says, after he was sold into slavery, it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And so we kind of start to see the beginning of God's plan for Joseph in this verse. He's sold to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar ends up throwing him in prison. In prison, Joseph ends up meeting a couple guys who work for Pharaoh. Through these guys, he ends up meeting Pharaoh himself. Through Pharaoh, he ends up getting a new job in which God uses him to do great things. And so the seed is planted here in this chapter that, hey, things are about as bad as they can get for Joseph right now. But guess what? God is working in his life, whether he realizes it or not. And so what I'm not saying is that if you, haven't faith, that if you have faith in God, that, that all your wildest dreams are going to come true. I'm not saying that. Joseph does end up becoming this powerful, prominent man in, in Egypt. I'm not saying that, you know, hey, God's going to make you the next president of the United States, or you're going to sell a million records of the, the, the uh, rock album that you just wrote, or whatever it is. I'm not saying you're going to become a millionaire if you have faith in God. The Bible doesn't say that, but it does say that um, you are not insignificant. You are not a nobody. You are not a person whose life is going nowhere. In fact, the Bible says in God, you are a somebody. He values you. He loves you. He cares for you. You are his child, and he wants good things for you. Let me go ahead and pray, and the band can come on up. Lord, uh, I don't know what everyone in this room is going through today. Some of us are are uh, feeling good today, and some of us are are really struggling right now in life. And um, some of us, we tend to keep things private. We don't like to tell others what's going on. But I know that there are people in this room today who are hurting, and I know that there are people in this room today who are wondering where you're at and and how could these things be happening. Um, if you have their best interest in mind. And so we just ask that you will help us to um, be able to learn from your word and from your spirit that you really are with us, that you really do love us, that you really do value us, and that uh, we do have a future with you. We ask that you will convict us of these things and help us to believe these things in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And so the million dollar question is this, I guess. What is God's plan for me, right? You, you may be asking, well, you keep saying that I have a future, that God has a plan for me. What's it going to be, right? Well, we don't know. We never know the answer to that question, unfortunately. It would be nice if we knew exactly what God had in store for us. We don't know what God has in store for us specifically. We don't know what the plan is, but we do know the promises that he's made to us. Those are the things we do know. Hebrews 10, chapter 36 says, You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. So in the hard times, when it seems like our life is going nowhere, we need to continue to persevere so that we can receive the promises of God. Well, what are the promises of God? What are these things that I should be persevering for? First of all, God promises forgiveness. We talked about that. God promises that your past doesn't have anything doesn't have to have anything to do with your future. Through Christ, you can be forgiven of all the stupid things you've ever done, believe it or not. <laughs> Through Christ, every sin you've ever committed, every time you've been disobedient to the Lord, he wipes it all clean from the record. That's one of the promises he makes. Another promise he makes is that we'll be in his family. We become children of God. We become his sons and daughters. And there are a lot of great benefits that come from that. We know, again, as children of God, maybe things are tough right now, but at least we know that the Lord loves us because we are his child. And that can be incredibly comforting. That's another promise he makes is that we, are, we will be part of his family. And, and the last promise that he makes is that we do have a future with him. Things may always be hard for you in this life, actually. The Bible never says that this life will not be hard. Some of us will have struggles and, and, and pains uh, uh, nonstop until we die. That's, that's just, unfortunately, that's the truth. Some of us are going to struggle in this life. But God does promise that you do have a future with me, even if things are hard right now. One day, one day, we will be with him in eternity, living in perfection, free of pain and free of struggle. These are the promises of God, guys. Forgiveness, family, and a future. And so again, I, I, I just want to encourage you to think this morning about, you know, how can I be comfortable in the fact that even though it seems like I've been dealt a bad hand or even though I feel insignificant, I feel like my, uh, my life is, 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 is going nowhere, how can I come to a point where I am comfortable in knowing that God has a plan for my life and that I am actually a valuable child of God? If you've never come to that point in your life, if you've never come to a point where um, you've asked the Lord to forgive you of, of your past mistakes. If you've never come to a point where you've asked the Lord um, to bring you into his family and to, and to give you these promises for the future, I would just love to talk to you about that today. There's no better decision you could ever make um, than to ask the Lord to do those things for you. So I'll be in the back of the room during this next song. If you want to talk about that, please don't hesitate. If you need prayer for anything else that's going on, again, some of you, I know, I know, some of you are going through some hard times right now and you're just... You're, you're, you're kind of private, you're kind of quiet, you don't like telling people about it. Well, listen, guys, that's what the church is here for, okay? So please don't hesitate. Come pray with us um, about anything that's going on in your life today. Why don't you guys stand and we'll sing this next song.